I've already gone along this evening, so I'm going to press ahead rather quickly tonight. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to try to look at verses, uh, finish up verse 12, look at 13 and 14. Do the best I can with that for you. Father, Lord, I know you're here. Lord, I know there's some amongst us that just don't believe that, don't believe that you're present. Lord Jesus Christ, I know you're here. You said we're two or three gathered together, and there am I also in the midst of you. Lord, I know it's so. I don't care if others don't. And of course, Holy Spirit of God, you're here. Lord, you're here in each and every one of us all the time. I don't know why folks don't understand, Lord, that when the church gathers, they're gathering with you in a way that can't be done any other way. Lord, I pray, open their hearts and their minds and give them understanding. Bless, Lord, I pray this lesson. Lord, help me to teach it as you gave it to me. And I pray and ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. Verse 12, where we're picking it up. And Colossians 3. Talks about bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long-suffering. Latter part of the verse. Bowels. Right. Bowels is being used figuratively here, quite obviously. Uh, I mean, it, it's no different than we use the, the manner of speech of talking about doing something from our heart. Okay? Well, we're not talking about that muscle that is in there that's hopefully still pumping away. Uh, it means to do something, it, it, it has to carry the saying anyway, do something with true depth of feeling and sincerity is what it means. Mercies. Being merciful is a divine attribute. It is through the mercy of God that we stand redeemed today. It's the only reason. One cannot be a Christian Okay, and again, I've always made the distinction between being a believer and being a Christian. One cannot be a Christian. One cannot be Christ-like unless one is truly merciful. Kindness. A couple weeks ago at the nursing home, and maybe it's three weeks ago, three weeks ago at the nursing home, I had one resident who wanted to come over from where they were eating and join the meeting around the tables. The only way to get to, to the spot he wanted to go is he had to come around behind one fellow that was there. Now this fellow's been coming to every meeting, saying, you know, follows along in the Bible, but, you know. He refused to get out of the spot. I even asked him, would you mind moving? Let this, and he just sat there and stared at him. You know. You know. You know. I mean, this fellow who pretends to be a believer. And that's exactly what I mean when I say it. He is pretending, you know, absolutely refused to show a little simple kindness to that other man. I mean, there's two things that I do not like. I don't like liars, and I don't like mean-spirited people, neither does God. You know, if believers would learn to exercise a little sincere kindness, not just to other believers, okay, but to everybody, including your enemies, they, you know, they'd actually find themselves being happier and more peaceful people. Go to Matthew 5 with me. Matthew 5. 38 to 48. We're going to read it all. Picking it up to verse 38. Matthew chapter 5. The so-called Sermon on the Mount. Lord Jesus Christ speaking. You have heard that it has been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Boy, how many Baptists do I know that that's how they think it ought to be? But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, 
let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him plain. They were under Roman occupation. A Roman soldier had a right to make anybody carry his gear and equipment for him for a mile. Where their roads, they were all marked every mile on that. Does somebody does that to you? Carry it two miles. Give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies. <clears throat> love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? And if you salute your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now the Lord spoke this to a bunch of kingdom-seeking Jews in his Sermon on the Mount. This is going to be the expected behavior during Christ's millennial reign. So why not get in practice now? Holiness of mind. That's it. We'll move along quickly. Holiness of mind. Okay, not just the fake feigned humility, but from the, the bowels, okay, from the heart, from your mind. Okay, Proverbs 23, verse 7, the first part of that verse says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs 4, 23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Okay? It was the mindset of our Lord Jesus Christ as a man. Go to Philippians chapter 2 with me. Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. There is no place for pride or boasting in the Christian life. It just isn't. We are all sinners saved by grace. And the only good thing about us was imputed to us by the Holy Spirit of God at our salvation. Except for that, we're no good. Plain and simple. Meekness. Prophet Moses. Meekest man on the earth. That's over in Numbers 12, verse 3. Every time but one, every time but one, when he was challenged by the members of the church in the wilderness, as it says in Acts 7.38, what did Moses do? He fall on his face before him. And he proclaimed, who am I? Who am I? And remind them that he was simply God's servant. And it was the Lord that they were challenging, not him. That's over Numbers 20, verse 10. The story there, though, is the one time, Numbers 20, verse 10, he got mad. <laughs> he got mad. He, you know, he said, must I fetch water out of the rock for you rebels? Yeah, and he smote it twice when he was told to just speak to it and destroy the type of Christ there. So in his anger and lack of meekness, it caused him 
to disobey God, and God wouldn't let him go into the promised land. That was the only time. And the only time they pushed his buttons one too many times. <laughs> you know, when you're meek, meekness is to be mild tempered, to not easily be provoked, angered, or dismayed by things. You are not easily irritated. You are patient. You are long-suffering. You are gentle. And which again speaks to over in our text. Long-suffering. Long-suffering. You know, in the first church to which Kathy and I belong, there was an elderly saint there by the name of Mrs. Obar. God bless Mrs. Obar. Her husband was an unsaved man. And he was rough as a cop. And he would often verbally abuse her over her Christianity. I don't know what ever happened, whether he got saved or not. But, you know, she never gave up on that man. She was long-suffering. She prayed for him daily. And she asked the church to pray for him weekly. You know, the Lord is very long-suffering. Ask me how do I know. I mean, after, after over 20 years of living in rebellion and disobedience, the Lord never gave up on me. The only reason I'm standing in a pulpit today is because of the long-suffering and mercy of God. Because when I finally came to myself, and was in my right mind and turned back to the Lord in contriteness and repentance and shame, he was right there waiting for me. And we must be no different. Verse 13, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. Romans 2.4 Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. We're going to come back to that verse. Forbearance. Forbearance is the willful and gracious overlooking of faults and failures in others with the intent of that graciousness leading them to repentance and the mending of their offending behaviors. That's what forbearance is. There's a purpose behind it. You're not just overlooking those things to overlook them. There's an end in it. And again, considering the amount of forgiveness and forbearance that we receive by the grace of God, we certainly ought to be able to extend that to our brothers and sisters in Christ. That scripture goes on and says, If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And here we need to go over to 1 Corinthians 6. If you're still in Romans, let's go forward a little bit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we want to look at verses 5 to 8. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother, and that before the unbelievers. Yeah, that does a lot for your testimony. Now therefore there is utterly a fault among you, because you go to law one with the other. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do ye not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that's your brethren. Well, you know, quarrels, unfortunately, are going to happen amongst believers. The more fleshly and carnal they remain, the more likely.
likely that the quarrels are going to occur. Psalm 119, 165, one of my favorite lines from the Psalms, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing shall offend them. You know, deal with the script, you know, with a quarrel in a scriptural manner. Be humble. Be meek. Be forbearing. Be forgiving. Refuse to be irritated. Refuse to be agitated. A lot of times that's going to end it right there. You know, but if the other continues on, let them be the one with the elevated heartbeat. Okay? Let them be the one with the indigestion. Let them be the one that loses sleep. That if they continue on to be unreasonable, then follow what the scriptures teach back in Matthew 18. Back, see what the Lord has to say about it himself. Matthew 18, pick it up in verse 15. Matthew 18, verse 15, Lord Jesus Christ speaking, we're going to go down to 17. Later on, we're going to pick it up here in a minute at 21, so keep that page open. Matthew 18, 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if you will not hear thee, then take with thee you know, one or two more. Then in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he will neglect to hear them, tell it to, unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. That's how you handle it. Hate to see things go to that extent, but it has happened from time to time. You know, how much and how often you know, have we been the recipients of Jesus Christ's forgiveness. Go down and pick this up here at verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? I imagine that'd be pretty patient, seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. What would you saying every time? Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. I'm going to read this all the way down to the end of the chapter. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. That's a pretty good chunk. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. And the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Mm -hmm. Hasn't God done that with us? Mm -hmm. So pay that debt for you. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred pence pretty piddling sum in comparison. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. Now he just got, now he still, he doesn't owe this debt anymore. That great big sum. Okay. He was forgiven it. Okay. So he didn't have to go and try to shake this guy down. Alright? And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, I will pay thee all. And he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was brought and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you. 
no if, and, or but there. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if you from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. And again, context, I understand. Okay. This isn't written to us doctrinal here, but I'm going to tell you what. Okay. That is how God thinks. That is how God behaves. Okay. And I'm going to tell you what. You think that he won't chastise somebody who behaves this way? That you won't get a heavenly whooping for it? This is, again, the expectation here of behavior for everybody in the millennial kingdom. Okay? But this is the expectation for us right now as the children of God the Father. It's how we are expected to behave ourselves like our Father. Verse 14, above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness. And we're just going to just get started into this tonight because the time we'll have to finish it up next week. There's a lot to be said here. Charity. Uh, the Greek word here that's often so much made of about is agape. Agape. What agape means is benevolent, charitable love. It is love in action, not just in sentiment or in word. It's not lip service. From Matthew, go to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13. We come into this, especially we get into next week, we're going to see how important charity is in the life of a Christian. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, Paul says, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, ooh, that's hard. It profiteth me nothing. Charity suffered long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Yeah, but whether there be prophecy or prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. <clears throat> For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, and it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, not the scriptures, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, a mature Christian, I put away childish things. I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass Darkly, and this is how we know it's not the Bible it's talking about here, but then face to face. Now I know in part. I mean, now all we know is in part. We walk by faith, not by sight. 
I know what I've been promised, but what have I experienced? <laughs> you know, just what I know now. Right now I know in part. But then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abide it, faith, hope, charity, these three. Those are important, all three of them. Faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest, greater than faith, greater than hope, the greatest of these is charity. <clears throat> those are some powerful scriptures right there. Ones that are well worth meditating on. Ones that are well worth memorizing. <clears throat> you must have charity, love in action, if you ever hope in this mortal life that would be worthy of the name of Christian. <coughs> All right, we're going to have to stop there for this evening. Does anybody have any questions for me? Anything that you would like me to repeat for you? Any verses or anything whatsoever? Any comments? Alright, we're going to stop then.